I could ask the panelists from this session to uh, join us at the table up front here. Questions from the audience. Where do we start? Okay, Hello we'll start again. with you. Can you hear me? Yes, if you, um, if you wouldn't mind saying who you are, where you're from. Or... Martha Kramer, I'm a master gardener. Um, I'm, I'm interested in home gardening and community gardening. I have a question for Bruce. I had a question earlier about um, making char with products that otherwise would could cause a problem to home composters, such as weed seeds and pretty much any um, regenerative part of invasives. Uh, it sounds to me, however, that if we all just sent them off to you, they would get cooked. Do you test for seeds in, is there a test for um, weed seeds in the compost? Uh question is, is there a test for weeds, that seeds in compost? Yes. You, you grow in it, you water it, you do it in a greenhouse before sending it out for distribution to the general public. And okay. if it doesn't germinate weed seeds in three weeks, um, that's, yeah, that's we, good we, we monitor temperature. So it's a good question. Um, and the compost that used to be distributed by the city and other contractors didn't undergo the same sort of uh, diligent mixing, turning regimes and temperature controls. So, so that so machine you saw fluffs blends and we turn it you know, 12 to 15 times. So that's specifically because of the heat? Yeah. Okay. Primarily, okay. yeah. Let me ask a, a second question real quick. <laughs> sure. To you, the same, along the same line, um, there are plants who that do absorb, I said who, <laughs> my friends, plants that do absorb um, toxins and whatnot, lead, for example, um, should those not go in compost, or how do you, do you detect any of that kind of thing, or, or are phytoremediation plants supposed to just stay in place? Very good question. We uh, haven't had people uh, sending us large quantities of brassicas and other things, uh, kale, um, which are often used to, to phytoremediate. Um, we do get some garden waste coming in. Uh, we don't separate it. It's a very small fraction of what we take in. Uh, we're more concerned about lead coming in in dust and painted lumber, mm -hmm. and we manually pull out mm -hmm. lumber that we see that has paint on it, um, and we think that it's probably the urban soils around houses and people's increased use of clean cultivation rather than leaving mulch layers around their houses um, that contributes to soil lead, some of it coming into the composting site. So um, well, uh, I- Some of the community gardens are actually built on places where buildings had burned. So I, and in terms of the toxins in the soil, what I understand is that it's um, important to use raised beds, but nevertheless, some long-rooted things may bring up those toxins. So I imagine it's tested at city soil. You yeah, we test. See it. We, we test our compost. So it's really yeah. very yeah. low, negligible, you see. Uh, it's not negligible because background quantities of lead in, in the soils are pretty high, uh, but we're well under the DEP and EPA okay. thresholds. Okay. okay. Thanks. Next Thanks. question. Yeah, my name's Patty Shepard. I'm from the Burbs. I'm out in Winchester. My question's very closely related because last year they have, uh, you know, in my town you have to take your dump to the dump and do the recycling, and they have a recycling bin so people in my town can take their grass cut clippings and throw them, and then in the spring or whenever they can come and pick up compost. It's just been sort of shoveled around. I don't believe anybody tests out there, but the question came up because most of the folks that are taking their grass clippings are using Roundup or whatever. So I'm curious about whether you test for chemicals with yard waste where you are, whether you know anything about whether some of the suburban groups that are recycling compost within neighborhoods are doing any testing. I just don't know much about it. So. Yeah. 
Um, uh, so the question on that, on do we test for pesticides? We do in our growth trials. Um, one of the pesticides we're most concerned about is uh, a class of pesticides called pyrrolids. And they've been a problem um, that was addressed 12 years ago in a class action suit that shut down the broad use of a type of pesticide, an herbicide that did not break down in the composting process. Most herbicides, when subjected to the heat, temperature, fluctuations in pH, uh, like Roundup, glyphosate, don't, uh, they degrade pretty rapidly in the composting process. This one type, the pyrrolids, amino pyrrolids, have been problematic. Um, we've done growth trials to see if uh, plants show that injury, the stress of, of pyrrolid residues, and haven't found them. They're very expensive to test for in the lab. Our budget doesn't permit us to do that right now. So I, I would love to have a, a bigger budget that we could test more aggressively for that. But the U.S. Composting Council is the nationwide um, entity that has taken on the producers of, of the pyrrolid products and taken them to court. So hopefully we won't see those in the waste stream. Thank you. Okay, question on this side. Yeah, this also goes to Bruce, but Louisa might have an answer and Joy might, all of you. Um, I think I heard you say, Bruce, that because when people do not use mulch and they leave the land bare, there's more worry about lead. Is that what I heard you say? Um, that it, people's it, practices have changed? Well, yeah, I think they, they may have changed, but I know what, what uh, there's, they're raking up completely. People used to burn it in their backyards. Right. <laughs> no, but the clean raking around foundations, bagging it, including the dust, and then sending it off to a composting site is we don't have the data that says that's specifically how some of the lead comes to composting facilities, but I think that's where some of it comes from. So in fact, people being extra clean is what's bringing lead into Just, the compost stream. Yeah, it's <laughs> being anal about their landscape. <laughs> they should let it rot in place, uh, or I, at least some of it. Can I add one thing to that? Um, I, I think the problem is that they're putting their soil in the compost. Because what happens is um, most lead, and I used to work in a, in a it's a long story, yes. but most lead is found in the first six inches. It's surficial lead because it's, it's, wet, it's coming from weathering paint. It also came from uh, traffic, which we don't have lead in, in gasoline anymore, but we did until the 80s. So it's really on that top layer. So I think what you're describing is people putting that into the yard waste, which they should never do. Um, and in fact, it's very hard to get rid of that, but you can put that out with construction debris in your uh, regular trash. Thank you. Very good point. Hi, my name is Andrea Ranger, and I'm from Somerville, and I have a question for Joy. Um, actually, a couple, but I was wondering what some of the biggest challenges are in sustaining people who or in your program and then maybe go off and do their own gardens um, or just sustaining the type of organization you run and your goals and then sort of a second part is whether you're supported by a network of urban agriculture or you're just kind of out doing this on your own. Um, so to the, the second question and I'll answer the first question, um, we are part of um, Victory Programs, which is a, um, an organization that has, runs 18 different programs. It's a nonprofit organization. So like a lot of our funding pay base and administrative costs are funded by them. Mm -hmm. And so it does allow for us to have a little bit of flexibility of being able to have funds to do the things that we do. Um, in terms of being able to, um, to the challenges around, or addressing the challenges around um, supporting people in our, our program is, yeah. is just the communication. So a lot of women are coming into our programs and they um, have uh, just the need of getting out of, getting out of homelessness and, and being housed. And so sometimes 
there is a number of individuals that don't want to talk about like nutrition, that's on the back burner for them. And so I think letting people know, or having classes, we have um, classes in the winter, and so that has been a major um, draw for a lot of the women if they can come to those classes. So most, probably about 60% of the women that come to the classes will get vegetables from us. We, we do provide vegetables um, free, free of charge while they're in the, the shelter. And um, so on a weekly basis, they receive a list. Mm -hmm. And we were finding that a lot of people weren't um, you know, taking up that opportunity, but it was because of the educational piece. And then we have women from varying backgrounds. So we started um, opening the lines of communication and making sure that um, they knew that there's a number of things that they might want that we could grow. Mm -hmm. And so um, we do surveys, we, we have them come to our um, workshops when they can. And then when we just see them, we, you know, pull people aside and try to have um, all of the staff to, to um, you know, to sort of like be in our marketing agents and, and talking to them about the, this free resource. And so um, I think that's how we mostly address the, those challenges. Is some of that education and cooking? Like what education. to do with these things? Yeah, so yeah. The, the workshops that we do in the winter are cooking workshops, nutrition workshops, mm -hmm. and um, kind of a, a mixture of cooking and budgeting. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. Yeah, I wanted to... Um, I see a lot of landscapes and neglected lots in the city that just are so overgrown, they just look, uh, it's, it's just too hard to deal with. And, but I heard about a wonderful idea which is called Rent-A-Goat. And it's actually, there, it's, a, it's a business opportunity to have a herd of goats that you can bring to a property. And, and it, they're ruminants, they're, they're very good at mowing down pretty much anything and uh, making, making a lot manageable. So I guess this is mainly for Louisa, whether this is something you could even deal with in, in densely populated Somerville and how does the municipality look at a, a situation like that? Uh, I know there other, other municipalities have used goats. I don't know of any around here, although I, I feel like I read something of one in Massachusetts. Hyde Park. Yeah, locally. Um, I think it's a great idea. I happen to really like goats. Um, <laughs> but I'm probably not going to be the one making the decision on that. Uh, I mean, I imagine a lot of our, our, we don't have huge urban places where you could put up a fence and, and release three or four goats. Um, so I, 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 I think it's a great idea. As an aside, there was an article last month um, saying that Amazon Home Services has just introduced uh, goat home grazing mowing services. So it's becoming more readily available. Um, I actually had a quick question for Louisa also. Um, did any of these forecasts of problems with contaminated food or entering the marketplace, were any of those ever realized? Or? Are you asking if we considered contaminated soil in writing our... Organization? No, no, no. I meant in terms of um, some of the fears that uh, observers, um, when the urban ag ordinance was passed, uh, expected apparently all types of boll weevils and other uh, diseased crops entering the market. Oh, and no, that was a joke. The boll weevil thing was a joke. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the things that were real fears were about rats, and, and chicken coops can in fact bring rats, as can rotting fruits, which is why we put in the ordinance that you have to keep these things clean. Um, and there were fears, there are, fe there are real concerns about urban soils that we've talked about, so we did put some uh, best practices, and we encourage people to get a test and to know what the land use uh, history of that site is. Uh, other fears, the biggest obstacle was really the rat thing, because there is still a perception that um, gardens bring rats, and sometimes we'll have a community garden, and the DPW folks will say that's what's bringing the rats, even though there may be a dumpster from a restaurant that's completely open right next to it. So that's just a perception and education. From what I know, uh, rats cannot subsist, subsist on community gardens. They need more protein. So, um, but that's what people, people, a lot of people think that um, uh, growing in the city is gross and chickens are gross and bees are gross and, and other people don't. I'm sorry? 
Yes, we have actually a couple of, of uh, breweries in Somerville. And, and one of them actually made beer from sumac harvested from the community path, so. Cool. Uh, next question. Um, uh, I have a question for Jonathan, but first a brief comment since I worked with um, a goat owner right in the center of Lexington and herded goats up and down the bike path and they were Nigerian dwarfs, so they were little and people would say, oh, what kind of dog is that? And, <laughs> And um, they love to eat, in case you don't know, they love to eat poison ivy, but don't pet them afterwards. <laughs> My question for Jonathan is, you've, you've got this extraordinary food forest in Holyoke, which is not known as the land of food forests. And I'm, I'm wondering about um, outreach and, and are there other, other families and groups trying to replicate what you've done. Not replicate's the wrong word, but trying to uh, follow in those, in those root steps. Sure. So when we first started out, our hope was that we would kind of infect the neighborhood. Um, but actually what, what turned out was we were getting more interest internationally than we are locally, which is a, it's good in its own way. One of the troubles that I've learned in the last couple of years, though, what happens is the the, there's a strong working class uh, community in our neighborhood, and but there's also a lot of rental units. There's a lot of turnover. So even if we get to know a neighbor and get you get they're friendly or whatever, they they move on. So hopefully we're injecting a little bit of knowledge and interest um, as they're there, but then they move away. We don't know what's happening, unfortunately. Um, so that's been a challenge. The other challenge is technically we're doing this illegally. The, the, uh, the Somerville ordinances are really great. That, that I'm glad you're, you're, you did that, and Holyoke hopefully at some point will, will be on board, but uh, agriculture is, is zone five acres or more in Holyoke, and, the, and chick, every, there's five towns around uh, Holyoke that all have pro-chicken ordinances. We're the only one that doesn't. Um, I think you actually had uh, Nuestros Raices, uh, an article up on the the, the screen there, um, we, we tried to pass an ordinance a number of years ago for chickens and it failed. Um, one, one reason is because it, Holyoke was traditionally a, um, an industrial, I mean, it started as an industrial town, it was never really agricultural. So the immigrant communities that came in would bring their animals, but they were, were you know, the ordinance said that you couldn't have them and that, that tradition has continued. So now there's a, a, a pretty great Puerto Rican community in, in town and there's also chickens is part of that, that culture, but it's looked upon as kind of third world. So there's a lot of racism and st stigma around animals and, and people, unfortunately. So that kind of gets ingrained in, in the public. And so I think the book that came out, and now you know Alex Morris being our mayor, there's a little bit of opening up and support of what we're doing. But originally, we're just kind of like, you know, don't say anything. <laughs> but but the, um, the agriculture, there's, that's not illegal. You can have a garden. Well, you can, but I, I have a nursery. Oh, okay. So technically, we're residential, so we're not supposed to be marketing our garden products from our doorstep. Gotcha. But um, Springfield last year just passed a, a market garden ordinance. So we're really excited. It's slowly eking um, our direction. They're also trying to do chickens, so... I think it'll come soon. Just, it'll just come soon. one more brief comment yeah. about that. You may or may not be familiar with the work that Alan Savory and the Holistic Plan Grazing familiar, yes. people have done, but it's, it's a fairly common story where a rancher will have all this improvement from Holistic Plan Grazing, and the neighbor on the other side of the fence still looks barren, and the neighbor will say, well, you get more rain on your side of the fence. <laughs> And the people who are interested in what's actually going on come from 100 miles away. So there's, there's a, a, I don't know whether you'd call it a neighbor effect or something like that, but it's, an, it's a phenomenon that crosses practices, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. apparently. Okay, next question. Hello, um, my name is Sven Peel. Uh, I came here from Connecticut specifically to hear what uh, the beautiful stuff you folks in Massachusetts are doing. Uh, my question is, Oh, first off, we're not doing it in Connecticut, so that's why I'm here. Um, my question, do I have to use this thing? It's um, better. Oh, project. Okay. 
My question has to do with working with people in need and the fine line, which is what I consider a fine line, between having them on site working and the products that they would then obtain. And many of the times, I mean, this is, it's happened multiple times in the past few weeks where it's basically like, well, if, they, if they're hungry, they need to work for their food. And that, to me, is not exactly too cool um, because you're trying to empower people. And so I wanted to learn more about how different entities, organizations, and so on, um, and personal experience, how you work that fine line with, and I also understand two people, uh, oftentimes in a city, you know, there's two parents, they're working full time, not enough time to do something, but they're still in need. So how, how do you manage that fine line, mostly working with people outside, it isn't even the issue with the people in need. It's working with the community who believes that everybody should pull themselves up by their bootstraps even when they don't have boots, just straps. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, th this is kind of a major issue. I think it's um, something that as an organization we're consistently um, trying to deal with and navigate. So. Uh, with the residents inside of our, our um, program, a lot of the women, if they are coming in, they are aggressively either trying to find a job or trying to find um, some educational opportunities um, because these when you are employed or you have an educational opportunity, it allows you to be able to, to receive different funding. And so what we've done is that we have um, created a program that allows um, the women to work at the farm for 20 hours a week and then save 10 hours a week for them to be able to do other um, um, opportunities, whether it's educational or um, they might find um, some other job or work training programs. And so um, we can own, we also tap that out almost every year. And then um, to be able to provide things to the community and try to get people to come in, I think a lot of that has to do with education and um, letting people know that the opportunity is there. So. Um, I think for the community that we work in, we're in, um, it's mostly um, West Indian American and um, African American, which are cultures that are or, like oral cu cultures. And so developing relationships and really going door to door and having people see your face is um, what has got, gotten us to get people to come in. But we're still struggling with that because that takes a lot of, you know, man hours. It's not just you can put something in the, the newspaper or um, post something on Facebook and then a ton of people from the community will come in. You have to go door to door and you have to be visible and you have to actually provide for their need. So I think it's um, something that is consistently um, an issue for most um, urban farms, at least in the Dorchester and Roxbury area. Yeah. Okay, we have time for one more question before the break. Sorry to the others. Please. I just had a question for, for John. Uh, if you were starting out, um, and you mentioned you and Eric were uh, uh, plant geeks, um, what plants would you recommend for um, just a small scale system just to get started? Um, are there any, like one or two um, great examples that might be a great, you see the most benefit either short term harvest or um, greatest benefit to the soil? So. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it really depends on your goals and, and the site. Um, uh, one of the plants I'm really interested in and have been for many years that uh, it's just right on the cusp of getting into production, I feel like, is sea kale, which is a, it's native to the coasts of Europe. Uh, it's a perennial collard that, you know, we have some that are 14 years old. Uh, so you plant it once and every year you get this amazing vegetable that we don't actually, it's unfortunate it's called CK. We don't really eat the greens, although you could eat the, the greens in the fall like a collard green. But we eat the, the broccoli shoots, and right now they're just starting to come up. So right around asparagus season, you get this amazing sweet broccoli. Uh, it's like a broccoli rob, but more sweet, not as mustardy. Um, and once you get those established, you, there's, you can't get rid of them. It's not like they're weedy, but uh, they're there forever. They have big, big tap roots. Um, and so even if you hit the root with your shovel, new ones pop up. 
in the garden. So it's something that will be around forever. And having a perennial long live uh, broccoli is pretty cool. Uh, it's really full sun, so it's just like asparagus. If you're growing asparagus or rhubarb, it's a, it's a third perennial vegetable that we could be eating. Uh, but it's, 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 it needs just a little bit more tweaking f to make it commercial, but I think right now farmers could be planting it and offering uh, spring broccoli uh, to everybody in Boston. Where can we get it? Uh, Foodforestfarm.com. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I, I, I'm actually pretty proud. I have about 60 linear feet um, growing right now at my production farm, and one one mother crown could produce 200 plants. So I'm the only person propagating right now. So if anyone else wants to start a local nursery and buy your starts from me, that'll be a faster way to get it propagated. Um, so good question. Um, so far, it doesn't eat it. Uh, it's, it's, it's the, you know, the white moth that flies around the garden this time of year. It's got a really thick, waxy uh, outer coat. But one of the problems, if we do some breeding work, you might start to lose that because you increase flavor, you know, the, the benefits of having a more tasty vegetable. You might start to lose some of the protections, but even, even amazing intense pressure from um, flea beetles doesn't seem to affect it much. So it's a really an adaptable plant that we could be growing. I could, do, I could be here all night talking about 10 more <laughs> thousands of plants. All right, please join me in thanking these panelists.